Welcome to Eating Together, the audio broadcast of the Food and Society Workshop. Every week, through our Field Guides to Food project, we share stories about food and society, explaining and inspiring actions to support and improve the systems that bring us our food. Today, we hear from William Mosley, professor at McAllister College, who talks about his study of the agricultural system in Botswana. I recently got back from uh, five months in Botswana, which is a uh, country in southern Africa, and I was there primarily doing two things. Um, I was leading a study abroad program. I had 14 um, uh, students from uh, these colleges that are members of the Associated Colleges of the Midwest. So I was directing that program. I taught two courses as part of that program. Um, and directed and, or, or led a number of excursions on weekends and at midterm break with, with those students. The other thing I was doing was doing uh, research on um, food insecurity or hunger. Um, I had the help of two uh, graduate students from the University of Botswana and we conducted 160 household interviews both in the city of Haberone in surrounding peri-urban areas and then in two villages. And Botswana is an interesting country in the sense that uh, it has very humble beginnings. Um, it became independent in 1966. So it was a British protectorate. One of the, it was kind of a backwater poor colony. Uh, but soon after independence, they discovered diamonds. And they have husbanded those, that diamond resource very carefully. Today, they're the largest exporter of precious diamonds in the world. Um, and a lot of that revenue they've used to invest in infrastructure, in education, in healthcare. So today, Botswana is a middle income country. So I was very interested in looking at a successful development uh, situation, a middle income African country where hunger pers uh, persists. And they face a particular challenge in the sense that they import 90% of their food. A lot of it comes from South Africa. And global food prices have been uh, increasing steadily since 2000. They spiked in 2008. Again, in 2011, 2012, they <coughs> surpassed the 2008 levels. Um, so there are high food prices in a country which is prosperous yet has a very inequitable income distribution. It has the second most inequitable income distribution in the world after Namibia. So you have a segment of that population which is poor, which is struggling to pay for food, and kind of faces chronic uh, food insecurity. So that's, that's what we were examining on the research side. Food prices were higher in the 1960s and 70s. Um, we went through a period of low food prices in the 80s and 90s, historically very low. And then, as I mentioned, they've risen gradually since 2000. A lot of people think about global population growth as lying behind this. That's a small part of the dynamic. More significant is the fact that the, the world is urbanizing at a very rapid clip. Um, the world is now over 50% urban, and when people move to cities, their dietary patterns tend to change. Uh, they consume a greater variety of foods, they consume more meat. It takes about 10 kilograms of grain to produce a kilogram of beef. So as the world is urbanizing, it's putting more stress on, on the global food system. And then also, I think shorter term, um, what we saw in 2008, and then again more recently, is rising global energy prices. And food production today is an incredibly energy intensive process, much more so than it was in the past. <coughs> so you need fossil fuels, not only for the mechanization of agriculture, but a lot of your inputs, your, your, your fertilizers, your pesticides, are petroleum based. So when uh, fuel prices went up, food prices went up. And along with that, when food prices went up, uh, or excuse me, when energy prices went up, it made things like ethanol more competitive, 
more people invested in ethanol production. So in the upper Midwest, you know, this is based on, on corn largely. So that even put more pressure on the global food system. Plus there was some financial speculation that was going on. It was worthwhile to invest in, uh, uh, you know, speculate on food markets. So that globally has, um, those are kind of longer term and shorter term reasons for food prices to rise. In the African context, I think um, there, there is, since the period of U European colonialism, which starts in the late 19th century moving forward, there, the European powers have been interested in kind of dismantling subsistence food production systems, that is food production for the local population, and reoriented that towards the global economy. <coughs> and they did a lot of that through taxation. So if you introduce something like a head tax, um, households then need cash to pay that tax. And the only way they were going to get that cash was by either growing cash crops or by migrating and working. Um, so people gradually produce less food for local consumption. They produce more cash crops for exports, some edible, some not edible, and they began migrating to work in either the mines or in commercial farms or in, or in urban areas. So what we see then is Sub-Saharan Africa has become increasingly involved in the cash economy. Um, they're producing less and less of their own food and, 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 and they're acquiring that through income they've generated through, through, through other means. I think particularly pernicious in the last few years is we've seen the kind of offloading of other regions' food insecurity onto Africa. So when global food prices went up in 2008, for example, a lot of Middle Eastern countries, North African countries, Asian countries, which historically imported a lot of their food, tried to circumvent the market by acquiring long-term leases to land in Africa for the production of food that was destined for, for, for their economies. So I think that history, that increasing engagement with the, the global food market, this recent history of land grabs or long-term land leases has made uh, many regions of Africa more susceptible to, 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 to hunger or food insecurity. I think a neoclassical economist would tell you that um, different areas of the world um, have different comparative advantages. Um, and so if you're particularly good at producing precious diamonds or uh, you're particularly good at producing cotton or, or or producing tobacco or producing beef, that's what you should specialize in. So um, focus on producing those things which you're very efficient at producing, take that income and then purchase food with it. And then, you know, everybody does what they're most efficient at and then everybody wins. You know, you trade and we all come out better. I think um, there are a couple of complicating factors. It, it, um, it exposes you to a lot of risks because usually what happens is your economy becomes more simplified over time, so you're concentrated in a few areas. And if those areas crash, okay, you see your revenue plummet, but you still have to kind of deal with these food costs. Um, so with, for example, the global economic slowdown, uh, Botswana is a major exporter of precious diamonds. There's just less money in the global economy. People aren't buying as many diamonds, so Botswana saw its, its revenues drop. Um, I, I think the other issue that you have to manage is that, um, you know, the rise and fall of food prices doesn't always happen uh, with the rise and fall of whatever you're producing in terms of price. So 
I think a number of African countries have actually been in situations where, you know, they're producing a com commodity that lots of other countries produce. There's overproduction. The, the price for that is dropping, while their food costs recently have been rising. So uh, their, their, their revenues are going uh, less far in, 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 terms of, uh, in, to, in terms of food purchases. Um, and so if, in a way, if you're a subsistence producer, you, in a sense, you don't have to deal with this, these kind of vagaries and risks of the market, okay, because irrespective of rising and falling prices, you will always have your food. Um, I think the other kind of related to this same neoclassical economic argument is this notion that, um, you know, small subsistence producers are inefficient, there are a lot of stereotypes about African farmers as being kind of backward and primitive, so that it makes, they would argue, I think, that it makes most sense for large commercial producers using kind of the latest technologies to produce food, they can do that more efficiently, and then, you know, those farms get big, they displace the smallhold producers who, you know, become workers and then will buy that food. Um, the evidence isn't really there to support the fact that large commercial producers are always more efficient. Um, and I think what we've seen is that these large commercial producers, because they use more energy intensive technologies, you know, those like I noted earlier, those, those food prices are going to go up when energy prices go up. And so you've got these workers uh, making low wages that are going to struggle to feed themselves. So in all these different scenarios, it tends to be the small you know, worker that, that whose, whose food security situation is compromised. I think a lot of small subsistence producers have been um, kind of characterized as risk averse in a very negative way. And, and I think what they're trying to do is manage risk. So, you know, one strategy is to produce one crop and aim for maximum production in a good year, um, but then everything fails in a bad year. So a lot of small producers are not going to maximize production in any given year, but they're, 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 they're planting lots of different crops on lots of different soil types in hopes that in any given year something will work out and they'll do okay. And on a strictly kind of cost-benefit analysis that may not look particularly efficient, but it is, it is, it kind of works like your insurance analogy that, that, you know, they, they're managing the risk. They don't, they don't suffer the devastating losses. More broadly in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's a sense that um, the first Green Revolution, which was an effort in the 60s and 70s, led by uh, Norman Borlaug, who's a graduate of the University of Minnesota, to take industrial farming techniques developed in the global north so the combination of hybrid seeds with pesticides and fertilizers and bring these to the global south, the tropical areas of the world. And so that led to tremendous yield increases, particularly in Mexico and some areas of South Asia. Um, it's not to say that it wasn't done at great social cost. Um, there was a lot of farmers that went out of business as a result of that. But big producers did produce more. Um, and there were also environmental concerns, concerns about uh, insect populations becoming resistant to pesticides, for example. But that first green revolution uh, had less of an impact in the African context, in part because they didn't really focus on crops that were major African crops. So one big focus was on wheat. There's very little wheat grown in the African context. Uh, as well as on Asian rice, but it's different than a lot of the African rice varieties that are grown. So 
There's been a big push in the last few years in the wake of the 2000 global aid food crisis to bring a new green revolution to Africa. These same sorts of packages of hybrid seeds, pesticides, fertilizers, increasing use of GMO, um, genetically modified seeds, to increase crop yields. Um, and I think the issue there is while that will increase total production, it won't necessarily solve the hunger problem because those types of technologies tend not to be accessible to the poorest of the poor. Um, furthermore, as noted before, you, you're in a way setting people up for um, a, a, a system that is closely linked to energy prices. So, you know, if the poor can't afford them, but the rich can, the big farmers become bigger, the small farmers become smaller or go out of business, they become dependent on a market, and then those food prices go up when, when energy prices go up. Now, in the particular case of Botswana, which is not a big agricultural producer, so Botswana is it's largely the Kalahari Desert, so it's a semi-arid country. Um, and the pillars of that account, economy are, are, are grass-fed beef production, high-end ecotourism, and precious diamond production. So I think the advice in the case of Botswana is you should focus on those industries. Um, don't worry too much about agricultural production because you can import this food from elsewhere, namely South Africa. So Botswana from the early 90s abandoned a policy of food self-sufficiency. That is a, an attempt to try to produce the food it needs within its borders and instead has relied on a food security policy that you're going to make enough revenue to buy adequate you know, calories to feed your population. And I think the issue there is that in a resource dependent economy, though that wealth tends not to be distributed very evenly, so it's a highly inequitable country. Um, so you have this poor population um, that is dependent on food imports. So what do you do when those that food gets expensive? Now Botswana, to its credit, has a pretty extensive uh, uh, set of state subsidies. So you know to help the poorest of the poor. But a lot of people are saying now that the government can't sustain that indefinitely. These these supports to the poor, um, and so I think. We may be at a point where we need to begin to think about agriculture in a slightly different way. That it's not just about producing food, but it's also a livelihood, it's a safety net for the poorest of the poor. And that it's worthwhile investing in a, a, an approach to agriculture that's acceptable to the, that is accessible to the poor in order to avoid um, or, or to minimize hunger among, amongst that segment of the population. I do think sometimes poverty is a social construction to the extent that, you know, if, if we def define poverty in terms of monetary income earned, we, we, there's a temptation to look at a subsistence farmer and call he or she poor, when in fact maybe they're only earning two hundred dollars a year, but you know they have a very good life. They're producing enough food to feed their family, and they don't suffer from hunger. Okay, so I think a lot of conventional definitions of poverty really focus on a numeric, monetized understanding of poverty, which isn't always appropriate. Um, now that said. In the context of Botswana, we do have an increasingly monetized economy. And I think at the end of the day, if, if um, human welfare is significantly compromised, particularly in a context where um, you know, a country is relatively well off, it's a middle income country, there are enough resources to go around, a lot of people would say that that's 
ethically unacceptable. If, if you know, one group is leading a very comfortable life and another group is suffering from nutrition deficiencies, that's, that's just not right. Botswana historically has very strong urban to rural ties. It was a mostly rural country at independence in 1966. It's also a small country. Today it only has two million people, okay, and in, in a country the size of Texas. So uh, I think Botswana and Mongolia are, are the two least densely populated countries in the world. Um, so urbanization is definitely a post-colonial phenomenon but it is a very rapidly urbanizing place. Today it is 60% urban, when it was almost 0% urban at independence. So most people who live in the city today, uh, you know, either spent part of their childhood in a rural area or definitely have relatives who still live in a, in a rural community or in the village. And if you walk up and talk to any Botswana, that's a citizen of Botswana, they will they, they, even if they spent their entire life in Habarone, the capital city, they will tell you that they're from a particular village. There's that sense of identity. Curiously, though, in spite of those strong connections, there is a very strong rural-urban divide in the sense that a lot of the poverty is, is rural in nature, um, and a lot of the wealth is concentrated in urban areas. And I think that's somewhat uh, uh, an artifact of the particular pattern of development that we've seen. So diamond wealth, um, this is what you know, provides the government with most of its revenue, a lot of the infrastructure. Um, it, while you know, they've spent, developed infrastructure in rural areas, a lot of that infrastructure is concentrated in urban areas and that's where a lot of the civil service jobs are. So the highest paying jobs tend to be in the city so that's where we see a lot of that wealth concentrated. And there is some, you know, there's, there, there are, there are um, you know, wealth transfers. People send money back to rural areas. What we see a lot of is people building homes in rural areas because that's where they want to retire. Or uh, most wealthy people will have a herd of cattle. Um, and so wealth tends to be banked in the form of cattle, and then that cattle is kept in, in rural areas where it's tended by, by livestock hands. Large numbers of poor urban households spend a very high percentage of their income on food, you know, well over 50%. Um, so that when food prices go up, this is, this is a real problem for them because they're limited in terms of how much more they can, can spend on food. Um, Somewhat surprisingly, I think we found that uh, rural households as well um, you know, are, are more dependent on the market for food than we had anticipated, that, that food production is fairly anemic, so they're not um, protected from the market in the way that we thought might have been the case. It was largely, it's largely older women who continue to farm. Now, I think, on the one hand, that maybe that's not such a bad thing. So, you know, in the United States, well, it had been 2% of the population still farms. I think it's now down to 1%. And you might just say that as an economy evolves and develops, that, you know, farming will go by the wayside. You'll just have a couple big factory farms that feed everyone. And that, um, you know, the ideal development trajectory is that we all get office jobs and work in the city. Um, so you have to think, well, is this, is this what's happening in Botswana? Is this, you know, is this just the normal course of development? Fewer and fewer people are going to farm. Um, and, and Botswana, to its credit, does spend a lot on uh, education. It's, it has one of the highest literacy rates for a country in the tropics in the world, it's like 85%. So, um, you know, I think there are many people in Botswana who would say that uh, 
this should become a very highly educated population that will, you know, Haberone, the capital city, will become a financial hub and it will provide banking services for southern Africa. That's one vision. Um, and I certainly think that could happen, but I think parallel to that, um, that form of development will always leave some people behind. And so if, if one is to think about um, a diverse economy, um, an economy that um, is concerned about the rural poor, about the urban poor, then I think there will be a continuing role for some form of agriculture. Um, so, I think what our research may end up showing is that agriculture is still important even in a highly successful middle-income African country. And it's important because it's, it's a safety net for the poor and that it's not acceptable to have people going hungry in that context. And I think even in the United States there are, you know, are some people that are beginning to think about agriculture in a very different way, that there's space for smaller scale agriculture for organic agriculture. In the Twin Cities we have a big Hmong community that traditionally farms and a lot of them you know, are in, you see them at farmers markets and so that's that's another livelihood that we shouldn't necessarily sacrifice to a kind of modernist view of development. It's very easy to, 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 to romanticize Rural life is kind of bucolic, and um, and farming is hard. You know, it's it's really hard work, and in some sense, you can't blame people for wanting to get out of a a hard existence, which is very risky in terms of, of in terms of weather patterns. Um, so I I think we have to look at it in a, in a, in a realistic way. Um, that, that recognizes that it is, it, it's not an easy occupation, but if you are operating um, in a situation of persistent poverty, high levels of unemployment, um, I, I think it needs to continue to be explored as a potential occupation. And I, I met and interviewed a lot of people that despite the hard work, I think, um, appreciated the fact that they had independence, that they had a, a know-how and experience with the land uh, that they could use to f feed their family in part or, or, or in whole. A lot of male extension workers or field workers uh, can only kind of interact with women at arm's length. So that's, that's one issue, okay? I think if your farming population is largely female, it makes sense to have a field staff, which is largely female. And then I th also think that there's a particular vision of agriculture, which is highly mechanized, energy intensive, chemical intensive, um, and that one, could engage with farmers using a, a broader set of acceptable models that like everybody doesn't have to be a big commercial farmer that there are other ways to go about farming about farming and that those are are valuable too so um, you know, part of the issue here is is it's a country undergoing a significant social transformation it's becoming urbanized people are getting more educated and they're leaving rural areas but I also think the government's approach to promoting agriculture has been overly male-dominated and overly focused on one modernist vision of agriculture.